Hey, what's up, everybody? Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Let There Be Talk. Here we are, Monday, February 3rd. You know what that means? It means that I am 54 years old today. Yes, February 3rd, the day the music died. That is my birthday today. And I am uh, very, very lucky to be here, alive and happy, enjoying life, trying to stay healthy. 2019 was a rough year health-wise uh, with the, the neck shit going on and everything. But I, uh, I push on. I'm 54 today. And as of February 1st, I finally got health care. Holy shit. 2020 is working so far. Thrash January happened. I interviewed some of the greatest names in thrash metal. Wow, that was, that was, that was an epic, organic thing that happened on this show. And I'm so glad you guys love it. Welcome aboard today. And uh, I'm just kind of uh, reeling in from the incredible four-day road trip that I just did with Mark Marin, who I cannot thank enough for uh, basically just being a fantastic friend. That's all I need to say about that man. He is just a, a gem of a human and a perfect friend to have at this point in my life, or at any point in my life, really, but right now, I think that man understands me as much as I understand him. Both never had kids. Uh, he's been married, of course, a few times, but I haven't. But we're both single with no kids at this uh, mid-50s point in our life. But very, very happy at what we're doing. He, you know, he's very successful. I am uh, out here struggling, but very, very happy. So it was great to uh, just be out. We did it before out in Texas, and now we're on this full uh, kind of East Coast run of a tour. Um, we were just in Cleveland, Grand, Grand Rapids. That's not the East Coast. We're about to hit East Coast. I don't know. I'm fucking, I'm all blurry today because we were just, I, we landed, got in cars, did shows, got in cars, drove four or five hours, did shows, got in cars again, drove four or five hours, and then came home, watched the Super Bowl, and, uh, and boom, here we are. I just, I don't know. I want to thank Mark for just, being a great, great friend and a mentor, an absolute crushing mentor for me and uh, just learning the skills of comedy. And by the way, we did do a podcast in uh, his car or the rental car, and that'll be coming out pretty soon. Let's get into who the guest is today. You want to talk about legend, you can throw that around. I do call a lot of people legends because if they're on this show, a lot of them are legends. They are people that inspired me, that influenced me, that absolutely uh, made me feel happy, and, uh, and, and a lot of them have blown my mind. This guy right here today, Robbie Krieger, Hall of Famer, guitar player, songwriter of The Doors. Are you kidding me? Look at this guy, this guest today, Robbie Krieger. I can't even tell you what it felt like to interview this guy. I did it right on the stage at the Whiskey A Go Go, right where that band got their record deal from Electra back in the 60s. And it was magic to be in there and just talk to a man who sat on that stage and blew people's minds along with Ray, John, and Jim. That had to be just so incredible to see The Doors back then. That is a band I obviously never saw. And wow, 
I, I, I ran down a rabbit hole at the doors many, many years ago, and it grabbed me like uh, a drug, and I've been in love with the doors ever since. Uh, once again, another band I could not stand growing up, had no, uh, no idea what I was missing out on. I just did not have the depth for a band like The Doors. I didn't understand the sound. What's this keyboard circus stuff? What's going on? And then one day I was uh, asked to be an extra in The Doors movie many, many, many years ago. And it's funny to think sitting on the set of Oliver Stone's film is where I finally understood the doors. And it wasn't even them. But the way that the, the vibe of what was going on while they're filming that, I just, I got it. I was like, oh, I, I kind of get it. It's... Uh, it's an honor to have Robbie on, and he's 74 years old. This guy is still out there playing and rocking it. He's painting. He's got all kinds of art going on, and I just, I just love him. I absolutely love him. His sound is so original, and we get into it on this uh, interview. It's, it's almost impossible these days to understand how hard it is to have your own sound because there's a million zillion guitar players and bands. But back then, if you look at these people, if you listen to them actually, and you close your eyes, you just know who they are. You're like, oh, that's Stevie Ray. That's Jimmy. That's Angus. That's, you know, that is definitely Robbie Krieger. And that is uh, a lot like what I... I, I strive to be as a comedian. They, they call it finding your voice as a comedian. Being able to be the person you are off stage and on stage. Same person. Mark is definitely that person. Bill is. Rogan. Um, th these, these comedians that they're, say, they're talking to you in the hall. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. And then they go on and it's exactly the same person. Speaking of guitar playing, you got some joint ache? I got joint ache. I'm 54 today. My name is joint ache. Dean joint ache Delray. <laughs> Get some CBD. I live for this stuff. CBD. Go to CBDLion.com. The cleanest CBD on the planet. Third party tested. I absolutely love this stuff. You having trouble sleeping? You got anxiety? You got joint ache? Uh, all of that stuff. This is going to help you out. Tinctures right under the tongue. Drop, drop. Next thing you know, mm, I feel good. Let's get on an airplane for four hours. I can handle it. You got some joint ache? Topical. Rub it right on your neck, your elbows, your knees, whatever hurts. Uh, how about your pet? Is your pet a lunatic? Bar, 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 barking all the time. They got uh, pet CBD. CBDLion.com. Use the code DEAN, D E A N. They also got bath bombs now. You out there taking baths? Throw one of these bath bombs in and put on some doors music and take the ride. CBDLion.com, the great sponsor of Let There Be Talk. Support them. They're helping out the podcast. They're, uh, these guys are just great humans. CBDLion.com, use the code DEAN. All right. Let me get into a couple other things here, and then we will bring Robbie on. I, uh, I recently was in Nashville and discovered this fantastic leather, leather, what do I, what do you call them? Leather smiths? <laughs> Anyway, this amazing shop called Loyal Strickland, okay? And they make some of the greatest leather goods I've seen in a long time. Check out their Instagram, Loyal Strickland. That's L-O-Y-A-L-S-T-R-I-C-K-L-I-N. Loyal Strickland on Instagram. 
out in Nashville. I went in there. I got an incredible bag, just unbelievable Horween leather bag, perfect for traveling. One of those roll top cool bags. Look at this stuff. It's unbelievable. Wallets, bags, backpacks, everything. Hit these guys up. Uh, I talked to him. He said, hey, uh, tell him to use the code Dean and I'll give him 25% off one time only. This stuff is unbelievable. My bag will knock you out. I'm going to throw a picture up on it on uh, the Instagram here and show it to you. Loyal Strickland. Code is D-E-A-N. Get 25% off leather goods. I love it. This guy is, this guy is a craftsman. And I'm looking forward to having him on Let There Be Talk when I get back to Nashville. I'm going to have him on one of the handmade episodes. Great stuff. Uh, all right. Some new Patreoners. Brian Spink, thank you so much. Gave me a little uh, birthday donation there. I'm going to go have a steak on you, buddy. Thank you. Joe Sabo. Eddie Blankbick, Blankbick, Richie Tice, all, all brand new Patreoners. One last thing, then the show starts, okay? This is the most important. I'm out on the road. I'm headlining. People keep asking, please come to my town. I'm, I'm going to be all over the place, and I need you guys to buy tickets so I can uh, keep coming back. Also, please Instagram and tweet and Facebook these dates. Tell your friends. Here they are. This Friday, I'm going to be in Santa Inez with Bill Burr at the Chumas Casino. Then, February 14th and 15th, I'm in Florida with Mark Marin. Awesome. Then I do February 20th, Portland, Maine with Marin, the 21st. Providence, Rhode Island, 22nd, New Haven, New Haven, Connecticut, as Jim Morrison would say. Paramount, Huntington, New York, Paramount Theater. Now, here's the headlining dates. Listen here. They're one-nighters. February 26th, the chapel in San Francisco. Please get tickets. They're all on DeanDelRay.com. Uh, Vegas, with Joey Diaz, Treasure Island, February 28th, Austin, Texas, March 7th. I'm headlining one night in Austin. I've not headlined in Austin, so please tell friends and let's try to pack this. Two nights in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, March 13 and 14, and Tempe Improv is up now, and that is in March also, and uh, Elko, Nevada, I think it's Elko, uh, Nevada in March. Okay, all the tour dates, deandelray.com. I also want to thank the Whiskey A Go Go, Amy, and the Maglieri family uh, for having me at the Whiskey and, and hooking up this incredible interview. Here he is, Robbie Krieger. I don't have a premise. It's uh, basically... I have people on the show that have inspired me in my life, and uh, you have definitely done that. So introduce yourself, my man. All right. It's Robbie Krieger from the Doors. <laughs> from the 60s. <laughs> from the 60s. We're sitting right here. Still going after 40. Uh, yeah, how old are you? 74? 50 years. Yeah. Set. How do you know? Oh, I, I looked it guess? up. Oh, I thought that was just a guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I guess. I, 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 before a podcast, and I was a carnival age guesser and wait, <laughs> and it bounced me out of there. <laughs> we, we're sitting here at the, the Whiskey A Go Go. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you this question because I've been coming here since the 80s. How much different is it from when you played here as far as layout and everything? Is it the same? Uh, it's, it's pretty close. You know, the, the stage actually was like right about here. They added this part to it, and it was high. It was always, I think this is about the height that it was. And uh, in those days, it was, it was fancy schmancy. You know, it was like checkered tablecloths and... Um, and then they had the go-go cages up there, 
um, it was, uh, you know, it was more like a, a New York kind of club. Right. Yeah. And and was the London Fog right next door? No, it was about a block up. By uh, by the Roxy, you mean? Uh, yeah, yeah, not that far, but uh, just the side of the Roxy, I think. And so was that place more kind of a dump and you were dying to get in here? Right, right, exactly. The, the, <laughs> yeah, the London Fog was kind of more like the whiskey is now, you know. It was like kind of, We I think we made $5 a night. $5 a night? Each. Each. Yeah. That's so, good money, that man. It wasn't bad in those days, yeah. <laughs> I mean, back then, <laughs> rent was like 50 bucks, right? <laughs> Well, no, not that low, but it was, uh, it was probably about two hundred for a, n- a nice place. Hey, now you you you've been in L.A. your whole life, right? Mm. Born and raised here. Um, and where where in, were you uh, born? In in Los Angeles. Yeah, I was born in uh, uh, Cedars of Lebanon Hospital, and um, we lived uh, down kind of down near the airport uh, when I was a baby, and then. Uh, Later, uh, when I was three or four, we moved up to Pal- Palisades, Pacific Palisades. Is that where you live now? You used to have a place out there, right? Um, well, I mean, I lived there when I was a kid, but uh, no. Did you have some crazy, like, roundhouse or something, like a, a architectural house? Um, you know what that was? That was actually my dad's house that he built, like, in the 70s. Uh, it was actually hexagonal. Every room was hexagonal. It was a cool house. Uh, in fact, uh, Fred Durst bought it and flipped it maybe ten years ago. I remember that. Yeah, and then and then it's been <clears throat> like all over the news lately because this guy uh, bought it and said and he made it sound like it was my house. You know, yeah. Oh, it's Robbie Krieger's house, and they had a picture of the doors up there, and you know, to <clears throat> to sell it, of course, which I I thought was not that uh, kind of sleazy. That's wild. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great house. Uh, you know, it's, my dad was an architect. Uh, I mean, he was really a rocket scientist. Really? Yeah. But he was good at architecture, all that stuff. So he designed the place himself. And uh, it was really nice. Did he, did he frown upon you uh, wanting to play music since he was like a rocket scientist? And so? <laughs> um, not not really. I mean, you know, he. I think he was just happy that I found something I liked to do rather than getting arrested and stuff, you know, which I did a few times <laughs> <laughs> before that. I, I got to tell you, I think that uh, I feel the doors are the heaviest one of the heaviest bands of all time without distortion, without the obvious things of like, say, a Zeppelin mm-hmm. uh, of that kind of heavy. But when I listen to The Doors, it's as heavy to me as something that Zeppelin would do or even later on uh, bands that are considered heavy. And probably it was the original heavy band, don't you think? Um, you know, I... I, I mean, I don't think you'd call it heavy metal by any means, but, uh, you know, it had those elements uh, that uh, I think those guys, all those guys took something from us, you know. Um, now, Hello, I Love You, that's got some pretty crunchy, uh, you know, distorto guitars in it. But other than that, you know, I, I pretty much plug straight into a Fender Twin Reverb, and, uh, you know, I might have had a... Uh, a um, what do you call it? A Gibson Maestro fuzz tone, but that was about it. Wow! Right into uh, those are the loudest amps made back <laughs> then, right? You put that thing on, it's just screaming. Oh yeah, they're loud enough. They're still, they're still a good amp. Yeah, in fact, what I use now is the Fender Deluxe. I mean, uh, what do you call it? Hot Rod Deville? Oh yeah, those are great. Yeah, which is pretty much like a twin. They have uh, they have the four tens, and then they have a two to fifty. 212s. How did you decide on that amp early on? Was because of the power? Like you didn't go Marshall or anything ever? Yeah, I never liked Marshall. They were too uh, kind of crunchy for me. Um, you know, I think they sound better with a, with a Fender guitar than Gibson, which I always use. Um, so uh, I just always liked the sound of a twin. Yeah, you know, I had the uh, black faced one. I had the silver faced one. And um, you know who Paul Warren is? Yeah. Yeah, he, he had this Tweed twin. 
which I always loved. That thing. I was always trying to buy it off of him. And uh, now I recently I found out that Joe Bonamassa has got a whole bunch of those, so I'm trying to get one from him. Yeah, those are those are great. And also, I, I love the high-powered Tweed Twin. You know, that's the Keith Richards right. uh, yeah. holy grail right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if you get an amp that is, you can play as loud as you want and clear without breaking up, then you can do any, you know, you can always use a pedal or something to break it up. But it's got that power and uh, cleanliness, too. I wanted to ask you this. Uh, I've had, I've been doing this show eight years, and most people that come on the show, I always ask them what got them into music because they're either my age or a little older, and it's either Kiss or Zeppelin. But who was it for you? Was it Elvis, seeing Elvis on TV, or what got you going? Um, well, it was Elvis hearing him on the radio. Oh. Uh, with Hound Dog, I think that was the first, you know, song that really, you know, it was my mom, she liked Frank Sinatra and all that stuff, so I'd always, you know, listen to the radio, and, you know, I liked that stuff pretty much, but when Elvis came on, wow, that just changed the whole ball game, you know, uh, and then when you bought the Hound Dog, on the back of it was Don't Be Cruel. Oh, man. <laughs> That's a pretty good uh, flip side there. That's a great single right there. <laughs> yeah, I think you got your money's worth on that. <laughs> yeah, 98 cents. So after hearing Elvis, do you realize, wow, I've got to, uh, I got to play in a band, or does it take you a while? No, it took a while. It took a while. Um, you know, I, I, I went through a period where, where I really liked, um, you know, when I, I used to go to the boys' club in Santa Monica, and on the on the jukebox there, they had Rock Around the Clock, Bill Haley. And people, you know, we would just play that over and over until we wore it out, you know, because that was the only kind of rock thing on the jukebox. Um, so I, I dug that. And But after that, I kind of, you know, rock kind of got a little corny, you know, with the early Beach Boys stuff and um, the early Beatles and stuff like that. So I was kind of a snob, you know. I, I, I liked uh, folk music. I liked Bob Dylan, yeah. you know, Joan Baez, uh, Ramblin' Jack Elliott. Great stuff. Stuff like that, yeah. Were you going to see shows here in L.A.? Were you hanging out on the Strip? Um, when I got old enough, I mean, you know, you couldn't get in here unless you were 21. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I used to go to the Ash Grove and the Troubadour. So the Troubadour was only folk in those days. Um, you used to see uh, people like uh, Brownie McGee and Sonny Terry, um, Bud and Travis, uh, you know, all, and a lot of the old blues guys came through, too, uh, at, the, at the Ash Grove. And uh, that was pretty cool to see Buddy Guy and, and Muddy and Albert and wow, all them guys. Wes Montgomery. In, in it. Yeah, yeah, used to see him downtown. Man, that's some, <laughs> that's some old school. I mean, the Troubadour and the whiskey, it's crazy, the history of these rooms, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it was funny because the Troubadour in those days, it was totally folk. There was no rock there at all. I don't know when they started doing rock at the Troub, but uh, we never... We never even thought about playing there, you know? Yeah, even the stage two of that room, when they get into, like, Linda Ronstadt and then the creation of the Eagles mm -hmm. and uh, all that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. And then uh, I remember I saw Fear there. <laughs> you saw her Fear? Fear. Wow, leaving Fear, yeah, huh? Yeah, leaving, yes. Wow. So that was more of the 80s, I think. Right. Yeah, so finally it made the tr total transition from Bud and Travis <laughs> to Fear. Yeah, I think it was all about ticket sales then, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. When you get your first guitar, is it, a, is it just like a copy, or was it a good guitar? Well, um, you know, when I first started getting serious about guitar, I wanted to play flamenco. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because my dad... I mean, that's a lot of your style. Well, yeah. Like finger picking and... Mm -hmm. My dad had some flamenco records, you know, so... Uh, I actually got a really good flamenco guitar from Mexico. It was called a Juan Ramirez P. And he was a he was a cousin of the real Ramirez in Spain. You know, so for 150 bucks I got this great, you know, flamenco Mexican flamenco guitar 
that was uh, pretty much as good as a, as a Spanish one. Because later I got the real one. I got the uh, a real Ramirez from uh, from Spain, and uh, they were pretty similar. Did you drive down there to get it? Uh, no, no. I, I I got it up here at some some uh, guitar shop. I think uh, what was that one on Pico? Um, oh yeah. You know. Yeah the uh, like the yeah the acoustic the, place. Yeah the yeah yeah. I love that place. Play shows there now. Back to uh, Ray Manzarek played there one time. So you were uh, you got the Flamico guitar, and then how long in do you decide now nah, I want to play you some rock? Okay, so I was Flamenco, and then and then I got really into Bob Dylan uh, and that, and that kind of stuff. So I'd played you know acoustic. Uh, and were you writing songs? Steel steel string. Nope, never wrote a song. Uh, I was just uh, you know I would I would play shows. You know do I would copy jack elliott or or bob dylan uh stuff like that uh that was when i was up at santa barbara in college yeah and uh when i when i was at high school i, I went to a private school up in uh, uh menlo park called menlo school and that was like kind of a prep school for stanford for kids that wanted to get into stanford wow yeah that was kind of neat so we had a lot of guys from back east and they turned me on to a lot of cool stuff. Um, like what stuff? Um, like uh, the uh, Jug Band. Yeah. Yeah, Jug Band stuff, Maria Muldar, Jeff Muldar. Um, who else? Um, oddly enough, uh, the guy that uh, produced the Doors records, Paul Rothschild, he had produced a lot of these records I was listening to back then, like Paul Butterfield. Oh, yeah. And... and uh, he had one called the Blues Project, in which uh, there was a lot of cool blues guy, Mark Spalestra, um, Kerner, Ray, and Glover. Have you ever heard of them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were cool. They had he produced two records from that for them. Um, so all the stuff I was listening to was Paul Rothschild, right? And then when we finally got a record deal with Electra, that's crazy. Go, well, this guy Paul Rothschild wants to produce. Oh, wow, <laughs> <That's> so cool! <laughs> yeah, he produced all my favorite records. That that's wild. That'd be like the uh, like right now, like say uh, Rick Rubin or or a uh, y- you know like a pr- a big producer now. You know, like right, I right. mean, is is Paul is he gone? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, he's he is gone. But his son Dan Rothschild is plays with me quite a bit now. He's he sings and plays bass, and uh, he's a great kid. Wow! Yeah. When you come back from Santa Barbara and you you get you get an uh, an offer to audition for the Doors, was it an audition or just an offer to play in the band? It was an audition. And what was that like? <laughs> Well, first, the 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 reason I got into electric guitar is because I went and saw Chuck Berry. Oh wow! Where at? At the Santa Monica Civic, oh. and it was a, a blues show. Okay, so this was early Chuck Berry, uh, before he kind of got bored and you know got pickup bands and stuff. He had the real band, right? Johnny Johnson and all these. Oh guys. yeah. Oh, my God. Before he just did the touring pickup band thing. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's a classic, right? <laughs> just shows up. You ever seen that? He's yelling at him, faster, right. faster, slower, <laughs> slower, you know? He doesn't even tell him what song he just starts. You know? Yeah, he just starts it, man. And he, and he demands to be paid in cash in a briefcase. <laughs> yeah, and we're going to do this in B flat. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, what? And then he's yelling at him, wrong key. I saw that, man, like two feet away. I was like, whoa, this is a brutal gig. <laughs> so you see him at the Santa Monica yeah, Civic. Yeah, that... And, and we just have to have happen to have some Acapulco gold at the time that oh, yeah. really kind of that made me I think notice more how good he was you know and he was doing the duck walk and the whole thing man it was just one of the best shows I've ever seen that place is going crazy yeah and then of course after that I saw Chuck Berry you know even played on this bill with him and he was terrible you know oh. <laughs> Pick up bands. Oh, that was I love cool. him in that uh, the Keith Richards movie, you know, the yeah, documentary. Exactly. Oh my yeah. god, yeah. I'll fuck you up. <laughs> <laughs> like, he's so angry, man. I love 
So you see him and you're like, all right, I got to get a guitar, yeah, so an I electric down guitar. To, uh, went, and is it immediately like SG? Why is it uh, SG Junior P90s? Because, what was it? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was actually the uh, Melody Maker. Right. The cheapest one you. Oh, can the get. cheap one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who? Because I, uh, yeah, I had. I, I wanted one like Chuck Berry, which was a 335. Right. But that was too much money, you know. So I went down to Ace Loans. You ever heard of that place? Ace Loans? Ace Loans. No. It's now Ace Music, but in Santa Monica, that's where everybody used to get their guitars because, you know, they'd get pawn shop guitars. And he had some pretty good stuff there. So I can't remember whether it was new. I think it was a used melody maker. And that's what I used on the first two albums. Really? Yeah. It it wasn't the SG Junior, huh? No. I never knew that. So what's the pickups on that? Those weird single coils? Yeah. And did you have the, the weird ones. one with the plastic switches? Or was it just like a toggle switch or normal toggle? Because some of those early Melody Makers had like the plastic switch to turn the pickups on oh, and all. No, it was a regular. Right. Regular and toggle. that's what you used on the first two records? Yeah, yeah. Whoa. Cheap, it shows you it doesn't matter what the guitar is. It's the Indian, not the arrow. Well, you are one of those guys, and there's these people like uh, Billy Gibbons. Uh, I always say, I tell the story, Billy Gibbons, you know, he played Pearly Gates forever, this million dollar uh, 59. But then I see him play a, a Gretsch plastic $2 guitar, <laughs> and that's Billy Gibbons. Yeah. You <laughs> can play anything, and it's like, shit, that's Robbie Krieger. I mean... That is like so hard these days. You can't pick out a guy like, oh, that's such and such. Maybe right. the last guys you could do would be maybe be like Slash or somebody. Mm -hmm. But, you know, even Jerry Cantrell, you can really pick out his playing. But I'm mm -hmm. saying these days, it's really tough to find yeah. your own sound. It's all kind yeah. of been done. But you really had this. The, the entire band was kind of this circusy, dark, mm -hmm. evil sound. Well, yeah, and we all had our kind of odd sounds for for what we played, you know, like Ray with the uh, <laughs> with yeah. the kind of classical with blues, you know, blues and classical, because he he grew up, you know, with piano lessons, doing all the classical stuff, but he lived in Chicago, where uh, you know the blues. He used to go see Muddy and stuff like that. Yeah. One time he asked to sit in, and he put it down. We wouldn't let him. <laughs> <laughs> so let's run through this audition. How do they hear about you? Uh, well, John, uh, who I knew from high school, uh, Densmore, um, he had already started playing with them. And uh, they actually did a demo. Uh, I don't know if you ever heard it. I, you know, I heard it in the box set, and I never knew they had a uh, they had that woman Patty or whatever on bass. Mm -hmm. I never even knew that until <laughs> when that came out. I always thought, boom, it was you guys, and then off and running. But yeah, yeah. So that was before I was even in the band. Um, and so Ray's brothers did, uh, in the band, right? Ray's brothers, both the, both one played harp and the other played guitar. Rick and Jim and um, Morrison, who who sounded kind of like a early teenager kind of voice you know so what happened was from that demo they actually got a record deal on cbs no yeah really yeah because i never uh, even knew that well yeah because uh billy uh billy what's his name guy that signed bob dylan billy james oh, oh yeah yeah he he liked them he heard the demo i guess and he he signed them up to uh, columbia what songs are on that again it's like, Hello, I Love You, Moonlight Drive. People Are Strange? No. No? A uh, couple of, uh, one called uh, Go Insane. <laughs> a couple of ones that never made yeah. it to anywhere. But, uh, you know, it was, uh, but you could tell there was those words, you know, Moonlight Drive had the great words and, and Hello, I Love You. So anyway, in those days, Columbia would sign a bunch of bands and they would see what would stick, you know? Yeah. So... Uh, Jim decided they, uh, they had a, a, a meeting with the head honchos, right, to see where it was all going with Billy James. And Jim insisted on going, and he took a bunch of acid. <laughs> 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 just, to worry, the meeting. I got this wired, you know. <laughs> 
The next day we were dropped. <laughs> wow, next day. I wonder what went down in that meeting. He's just I know, on acid I would have loved there. to have been there. I would have loved to have been oh there. Oh, my God. Fly on the wall, you know. That's such a, uh, an outlaw movement. Yeah. Do, do you, it's weird, too, that the band didn't freak out. Like, hey, man, what are you doing? We just got dropped. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's pretty wild. I never heard that. Yeah, but, uh, you know, th we didn't really have a whole lot of uh, faith in that thing anyway, because, like I say, Columbia was known for signing a bunch of bands, and then they'd keep, like, 5% of them, you know? That yeah. Was it. And we really hadn't even played a gig at that point, you know? So we didn't have a following. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of hope for that. But uh, six or eight months later... We were playing at the whiskey, and, and the guys from Electra came down, and, and they liked it. At what point does it kind of take off with a draw? Was this strip kind of like it was in the 80s, where people were just going out every night? Was the band drawing, or was the scene drawing? It was a scene. Right. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that was, it was big time. Hippie uh, heaven on the strip. Um, 60, late 66, early 67. Yeah, it was, it was a great, great place to hang out. I mean, you guys get signed from uh, from Electra, and then a week later you're in doing your record, and then like um, two months later the record's out. Well, it wasn't quite that quick. Well, it just seems like it, you know. <laughs> yeah. It's like it, was, it just seems yeah. like lightning speed. It was out. Well, actually, yeah. I mean, I think we got signed in summertime. Uh, you know, maybe June or something like that, and the record was out in January. Yeah, yeah that probably doesn't happen today. <laughs> I mean, look at that debut record, it's so insane what's yeah, on it. I know. And, and I just mean, to think that the end w was on that, I mean, for a record company to think, like, yeah, yeah, go ahead and put, I mean, that's a time where it's well, it, Electra was cool that way, yeah, you know, they were. Had Jack Holtzman, who was the owned owned the label. He's amazing. And, yeah, and he had Paul Rothschild producing, Bruce Botnick do engineering, and uh, you know they had done Love before us. Yeah, you know, and Love we were they were our, our idols, you know, because they were the biggest thing happening in L.A. Yeah, at the time, and um, so Paul and Bruce had done them, and. Uh, so we had total confidence in them. Uh, and, you know, we'd been playing those songs all summer. So to record them was easy. It was just plug in, turn the tape machine on, and that was it. What was Paul doing? Was he doing any arrangement changes, or was it just plug in and play? He made one change, which is probably the best one he ever did, which was on Light My Fire, Yeah, which was... The uh, you know the intro, da, 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, that was not an intro at the time. That was in the middle of the song to get back from the instrumental part back to the to the verse. Okay, so Paul said, "Man, that's a great part. Let's stick that in the beginning and at the end." So yeah. it happens three times if you notice in in oh, yeah. the fire. You know, he's got that part, and it's the hook. Of course, yeah. Although as it turned out, it really wasn't necessary. A hook because Feliciano did it later without that part at all. <laughs> <laughs> Still made number one and made his whole career, just like it did for us. When you guys are, you go into Sunset Sound to do this record, is it was at the time? Is it four track, eight track, sixteen? Four track. Four track. Four track. Yeah. And. And, and was we thought that was pretty cool. You know, yeah, right. Because everything was two track before that. And two inch tape? No, no, one inch. Whoa, one inch tape, four yeah. track. Oh, it might have been, might have been half inch. Yeah, I think it was half inch. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And all record? Is it recorded live? No, no. We uh, like I said, we had four tracks. Yeah. So we had the organ and guitar on one track, <laughs> which was stupid. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> drums and voice in the middle. So that took two tracks, and then we had another track to overdub. So we do the some of the vocals that he didn't get right on the first time around, uh, and then, uh, for instance, I I overdubbed the bass on a couple of songs uh, on uh, what do you call it, Soul Kitchen? Yeah. And Backdoor Man. Yeah. And uh, and then Larry Nectel, who was a great session guy, he he overdubbed the bass on Light My Fire. 
did the exact note for note that Ray did on the piano bass. So there's really two basses on Just that Just to song. fatten it up? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, when I was growing up, The Doors was, it, to me, it was tough. To, uh, it wasn't a band I understood growing up as a kid. I grew up in San Francisco Bay Area. And it was so like, how old were you then? At 53. Oh, back then? Yeah. When so I first were... started hearing The Doors, of course, it's in the 70s, and I'm like, ah, I don't know about this. <laughs> what is this, mm -hmm. you know? And then The Doors are a band, when it fucking hits you, you go down a rabbit hole and all of a sudden you, you're buying clothes <laughs> to look like the doors. You're, you're, you're being weird. You know, you, you know what I mean? And, man, and then there was all these bands in the 80s that were really grabbing onto the doors, of course. Like there was a band called The Front. They were dead on like really? the doors, man. Oh, I never heard of them. Yeah, I'll, I'll send that over to you. But, mm -hmm. and, and the doors were really... Uh, Echo, once, and Echo and the Bunny Man. <laughs> What's that? Echo and the Bunny Men, remember them? Yeah, Echo yeah. and the Bunny Men. Yeah, they, yeah. they were total. But once nuts. it grabs me, it's it, it's grabbed me for life, and uh, and uh, at some points, full obsession. Wow. You know, just like <laughs> oh my god, because it's it's this thing. My buddy said it yesterday. We were out hiking. Greg Dooley from the Afghan Wigs. You know that band? Oh yeah. Yeah, Greg. So yeah. he goes, oh my god, Robbie Krieg is a god. He goes. What he did was he reinvented the blues, the doors. They, they, no one had ever been able to reinvent the blues. Wow. And I said, yeah, you're kind of like the L.A. blues, like Steely Dan's are like cocaine jazz, you know, like mm -hmm. L.A. cocaine jazz. The, the doors were like an L.A. blues band. And when you hear the doors... It is L.A. to me. More than Van Halen ever. There's always that argument, what's the greatest uh, debut L.A. band? Yeah. Is it Van Halen 1 or, or The First Doors? And it's, it's The First Doors to me because when I hear it, I feel Los Angeles. I feel Malibu. Mm. I feel Venice. I feel, you know, Mulholland. Yeah, L.A. woman. <laughs> yeah, L.A. woman, you know. You feel that, man. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. I'm glad you feel that. It's it's it's, uh, it's it's absolutely Jim, yeah. Jim would love that because he, uh, you know, he thought he like he said the West is the best, you know. I, oh, yeah. the West is the the West is, <laughs> is the, the best. best. <laughs> yeah, and also with the Doors, you can't do it without doing Jim. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mojo Rise. It's just it's in you, man. Yeah, yeah. When you guys do this record, and, and it, it 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 actually take it it takes off. And you start touring. I looked at some of the, the uh, touring schedule. You guys didn't really play a lot of touring, right? It wasn't no, like. Not, not like they do today. Yeah, so. I mean, like you do like 26 gigs and then go do a record. That's pretty wild, right? Yeah. I mean, a lot of it was because Jim was so nuts that he, he, we couldn't take him on the road that long, <laughs> you know? And, and, uh, uh, you know, especially once you have New Haven and then Miami, of then, course. and nobody's going to take a chance on us, you know? Right. So we just said, all right, fuck it, we'll just record, you know? Which was good, because we ended up doing six albums in four years. Yeah, I mean, that's incredible. And the, and the, the outpouring of writing was unbelievable. Now, you guys, like, you were writing, you were some of the big, big hits, but I like how you smile on that. <laughs> now, when you guys are actually writing, was was Jim actually writing those whole songs? Like, here's how it goes, and you guys would just get some music behind it. Um, some of them, some of them. Like he, uh, you know, he uh, he told us that he was up on Dennis Jacobs' roof, which is where he lived for a while. Yeah. Um, it was like this place down in Venice, and it had a rooftop kind of cabana or something like that. So he would, he said he would smoke this uh, Acapulco Gold. Yeah. And a, a song, a concert would come to, into his head, and all he had to do was write it down. You know, that's crazy. And then he would hum the song to you? Mm hmm That's crazy. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, like the first, you know, uh, Moonlight Drive. Yeah, that, that's how that happened with Ray on the beach. You've heard that story. That's that story's nuts. Hey, I write songs. He's like, yeah, let me hear one. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, yeah. he's, he he starts singing it. And he, I mean, imagine like if somebody came up to you right now and did that. And the thing you, is, you know, you could sing that song and 
and the music might come out in a hundred different ways. Right. You know, so that's Ray was great at at you know intuiting what Jim would uh, you know for those first few songs, especially. Uh, after that, you know, Jim and I would write together, um, and you know, we just uh, I would play something. acoustic. Yeah, yeah, and. Uh, by that time, he'd kind of run out of those movie songs that he yeah. saw in his head, so he'd just, he'd have to, you know, make up words or look in his poetry books and and find something, you know. Now, was the whole band getting crazy on psychedelics and stuff, mm-hmm. uh, or were you just m- experimenting on it? Well, uh, you know, actually, Jim was the one who was really uh, into that. Uh, I mean, we all were, but. Uh, John and I had been into it for a year or two before that. So we were kind of getting tired of it. You know, we, we were, <laughs> you know, I, I was kind of the Timothy Leary of UCLA. Well, I used to give it to everybody. No shit. Yeah, you were and, just passing out acid? Yeah. And, <laughs> which is a dumb, I finally realized that was a dumb idea because, you know, one of my friends took too much and then he went nuts and... Yeah, I started. I felt really bad. So that's when John and I started looking for something else, meditation, yeah. TM. Yeah, you know, we were the first guys that, and, and Ray, because Ray had taken too much acid and he just <laughs> he'd had enough of it. So uh, we all ended up at the first meditation meeting in L.A. Wow, really? Yeah, first time Maharishi had come to L.A. and it was at my friend's house. My buddy Peter Wallace had gone to India. He was this one of these crazy guys, and he went to India in search of a guru. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, I'm and, gonna go search out a guru. Yeah, and I he, love that uh, hippie shit. Yeah, and he 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 talked to a bunch of them, and and then he met Maharishi, and he said, "Wow, this guy's the real shit." And he talked him into coming to L.A. So at his parents' house was the first meeting of. Uh, they didn't even call it TM yet. It was just called meditation. Right. And there was maybe 12 people there. And among those 12 was me, Ray, and John. Wow. And and did you get it right away? Because I've started meditating over the last couple of weeks. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I want to get into it. People are like, yeah, it'll help with blood pressure and anxiety. Yeah. And I haven't really... Uh, I'm trying, you know, but did you yeah. get it right away? Well, no, it takes a lifetime, you know. Yeah, yeah, it takes a lifetime. <laughs> but Ray thought it would be like immediate, right? Yeah. So <laughs> at the, at he's the, like, "This shit ain't working." <laughs> right. At the second meeting, he goes, um, "Okay." Any uh, the guy goes, "Any questions?" And Ray raises, uh, "No bliss." <laughs> 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 he thought it would be instant bliss. Oh my God! That <laughs> That's is... what Maharishi always talked about: bliss, and bliss. You know. Yeah. And you still meditate? I do. Yeah. yeah. So Daily. Ray, Ray gave it up at that point. Uh, no, not every day, but you know, more or less when I feel like I need it. Yeah, with this LA traffic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now, you guys are you you your record, your first record to hit. And then do you go out and buy this SG Junior, or how does this happen? Like, you're like, I no, need to... A- my first one got stolen. Oh, that Melody Maker? Yeah. Oh, bastards. Yeah. Was it a tobacco burst? No, it was red. Oh, it was red? Yeah, oh, one of those, red. like the, yeah. yeah, the stain, like cherry stain. Yeah, it was kind of dark, you know, red. Maybe it was tobacco, I don't... Um, it got stolen on, on the road? No, just at our rehearsal place, I think. Oh, God. And you only had one guitar. Yeah, yeah, I love it. So, you got a record deal. And, you got uh, one guitar. <laughs> yeah, in those days, nobody collected guitars. Yeah, you hear that, you, know? you guys? I mean, yeah, it was crazy. So, uh, and I didn't even care. I just went and bought another one. You know, I, yeah. I bought a a black uh, black one with uh, what was a SG with two pickup with, with, with humbuckers with the humbuckers. Yeah. Oh wow! I couldn't tell the difference. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At what point do you get that 54? Like, is that around the L.A. Woman record? You get that um, weird 54 that Les was, Paul? That was around, uh, it was a little before that. Um, this buddy of mine, uh, Rocky, had, had, I don't know where he got it, but he wanted to sell it quick. <laughs> so I got it for, uh, I think I gave him $400 for it. Nice guitar. I still have that one. Did you modify it yourself, or is that how it was with that weird pickup situation? And that's how it was. 
Wow. Or no, no, I did do modified that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know why I did that. But <laughs> when you go in for the second record, is it is it like total pressure because you had this big record? Is Electra changed now? Is Paul like, we got to get this going? Um, no, but, uh, you know, it was different. It was totally different because, you know, the first record, we were, didn't have any money or time. So we just had to do it real fast. Right. And the second album was like making Sergeant Peppers. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. It was uh, in the studio for weeks on end and, uh, you know, eight hours for a drum sound and shit like that, which, uh, you know, I thought we were kind of overdoing it there. But, you know, came out with some good stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love it. You're like, yeah, there was some good mm -hmm. stuff on that. I love the Ed Sullivan performance. I love a lot of the TV performances, the ones that aren't lip synced, you know. But the Ed Sullivan one is, uh, I mean, that show is so monumental back in the day. Like, you played that, it, it made you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That was the biggest, you know, that was like uh, MTV in those days. Because that's the only national show you could play that you know, got to everybody. So all that, you know, you always, that was the goal to get on Ed Sullivan. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. yeah. At that point, your parents got to be flipping out, right? They're like, oh my God, you're oh, on yeah. Ed Sullivan. Yeah, they loved it, yeah. They were our biggest fans. They used to, they followed us around Europe and stuff. <laughs> oh yeah? Oh yeah. <laughs> that is amazing, yeah, man. they were pretty cool about the whole thing, you know. They loaned us money to buy a piano bass one time, which was pretty cool because, like you said, my dad was like a rocket scientist, and you know, I'm sure he wanted me to be, uh, you know, at least finish college, you know, which I didn't. I, you know, because uh, once we started playing the whiskey and we got the record deal, I just stopped going to UCLA. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, it, it's funny because you guys were all college guys. Yeah. You know, to think about that, like, <laughs> these guys were in college. Like, I don't know, when I was growing up, I don't know any, the band guys were dudes that couldn't go to college. <laughs> They're like, oh, I, I didn't even make it out of high school. But you guys yeah. were like UCLA and yeah. and Santa Barbara college guys. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, well, I mean, the only reason I was in college was to stay out of the draft, to tell you the truth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, it, it worked for a while, but still had to go in for the physical and and lie and cheat and say I was I was gay or something. <laughs> it's funny how your music was such a soundtrack to the Vietnam War. Yeah, uh, really wild. And, yeah, and one of the most so many guys have talked. Uh, you know, I've talked to from that are vets and say that that we got them through that whole thing. Yeah. From, and the Doors was one of the favorite bands yeah, over there, which is why, you know, Oliver Stone uh, uh, was obsessed with the Doors. Yeah, yeah, of course. When he was over there, he was he was real into the Doors. It, it, I, when I first met you, I said, "Yeah, I, I, uh, I was uh, like, I had like an extra part in that Doors movie when I was a kid." And he said, "Ah, fuck that movie." <laughs> But you guys really hated that film, right? I mean, it. I, I mean, as far as I could see, it, you going like, "Ah, that's not what happened." But it did make this massive uh, w second wave of fans. No, I think you're thinking of Ray more. Ray hated the movie. Oh, Ray hated. Yeah, the movie. Ray hated the movie. I actually worked on the movie, uh, trying to, you know, make it better. But I at least got the. Uh, I made sure that the concert scenes were true to life. So he really, he did do a great job of the Miami thing. Um, the one in, uh, uh, we did one up in San Francisco. And, yeah, I was uh, at the Olympic Theater one. So that was supposed oh, okay. to be Miami. That's right. The sheep. And uh, <laughs> I mean, I was blown away when I first saw, because when I was, there on the set they're like look when val gets here you gotta call him jim right. and we we're laughing <laughs> we're like you're fucking dumb mm -hmm. you know and then he came in and we were like 
oh, what the fuck? Mm. I couldn't believe it, actually. Yeah, no, he was great. He, he should have got an Academy Award for that, for sure. Yeah, he got robbed, huh? Yeah. I forget who got it that year, but... Yeah. I don't think he was even uh, nominated. I don't think so, yeah. Which is, which is strange, because... Yeah. Uh, I mean, I heard the story was they already had a Jim casted, and then they gave this VHS tape to Oliver Stone and said, hey, check this guy. And he goes, I already got a, a guy doing Jim. And they're like, no, you want to check this out. And he looked at it, and then he was like, who is that? And they're like, Val Kilmer. <laughs> I mean, I don't yeah, know if that's... No, Val, Val, yeah, he, in fact, he showed me the video. It was a, Val actually had a Doors tribute band just you know, when he, before he was uh, even doing films. And uh, he, he said, hey, check this out. And I said, wow. You know, but he looked nothing like Jim, uh, you know, in, in that film or, uh, you know, before he had the makeup and stuff. But once he got in the character, man, he uh, he made you believe it. That was heavy, yeah. right? I mean, it yeah. was. were you, like, watching that? Like, wow, this is kind of... Uh it's pretty insane. Yeah, same same with you. I I yeah, I was calling him Jim. Yeah, you know. Ah, uh, you were calling really? him Jim. Oh, yeah. You, yeah. that is classic. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah. I remember the uh, uh, Matt Dillon's brother was the drummer. Right. Right. Kevin. And they, I remember between scenes they were coaching him <laughs> yeah. on movement. Yeah. My buddy uh, uh, Bruce Gary was the drum coach, and he. Uh, and who he played you? Well. Uh, a guy named Frank Whaley. Frank Whaley's a good actor. He's he, he'd been in a lot of stuff after that. Uh, he he was in that Jimmy Hoffa movie where he shot Jimmy Hoffa oh, in yeah. the car, remember? And uh, he's a good actor. And then uh, who did Ray? Uh, uh, McLaughlin. Kyle. Oh, wow. Kyle McLaughlin. Yeah. I just remember they had me looking like Paul Williams. Really? <laughs> I was wearing a a white leather jacket with fringe and leather pants with fringe and so side which, which scene were you in i was supposed to be in this uh kind of backstage scene it never made it when he shows up and he says how is it out there and we're like oh it's rough because they booed the band off at the miami show right what's at the at the miami show yeah. and then they come it comes out it was five to one all right and uh and he was really singing that, right? Oh, yeah. He sang like 90%. Of it the was stuff. unbelievable. He was really good, man. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, after that, yeah, he'd come and sit in with, my, with me once he, in a while. He would come and sit in? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A couple of years ago, he, we did it up, at, uh, up in, uh, where was it? Minneapolis, I think. I saw you play you in Golden Gate Park in San Fran. And it was years ago, like probably 25 years ago or something. And you were killing it. Yeah. You were singing. I was singing. Yeah, you were singing some of the songs, you know? Yeah, yeah I still do that. Yeah, and I was like, hey, this guy's smoking it, man. <laughs> I yeah, man, I should have been the singer. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, no. When you guys were out on the road, would Jim's voice ever go south? Never. Hardly ever. No. I mean... You know, sometimes he'd, he'd sing in a lower octave, and I could tell his voice was a little mashed up. Yeah. But uh, never really lost his voice like so many people I know have done. You know, it's so, so easy to do it with the Doors songs, because, you know, some of that stuff is, those notes are hard to hit. The fire! Oh, yeah. yeah. And especially back then, the shit monitors. Right. It's just right. side fills or no monitors. Oh, yeah. I mean, Jim was... Uh, I felt bad for him because, you know, like you say, no monitors. Yet, so he'd have to go out just to the point of feedbacks just so he could hear himself in the house. Yeah. You know? Let's talk a little bit about that first trip up to San Francisco to the Matrix Club. Those are some amazing recordings and pretty early on of the group, uh, like right when the record comes out, right? You guys yeah, go up right. there. I've got those Matrix tapes. Yeah. And, uh, what was that run like? Was because it was that your first run to San Francisco? No, I think we'd we'd been there a couple of times. Um, so we played at the Fillmore and then, uh, or the um, what was the other place? Chet Helms, uh, not the Winterland, but the Family Dog. Oh yeah, Family, Family Dog. Dog. 
So we'd play at one of those places. And then, and then during the week, that would be on the weekend. So during the week, you'd play at the Matrix, which was owned by uh, Marty Ballin's yeah. dad. And uh, they would record everything. So, um, yeah, we got some pretty good uh, recordings. And it's so funny because, you know, we'd play a song, and after the song is done, you'd have 10 people clapping. 10 people. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting versions though, because they're not, they're they're kind of um, not stock, but they're really kind of in the box. You're not stretched and stretching out yet, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that's wild to hear that kind of early on. Yeah, in fact, uh, at, that was right about the time when we were recording. Um, I don't remember it was the first or the second album, but and you know when you're recording in the studio. You're playing those songs over and over again, so that's probably why it kind of sounds like that, because, you know, it was just kind of automatic. Yeah. Uh, instead of uh, too much uh, uh, improvisation. Did you guys have a good record deal back then, or was it one of those classic rip-offs? Uh, it started to be a classic rip-off. Um, where uh, The good thing about it was most record deals then were five years, and we ours was three years, oh. which was good because um, after three years, if you're doing really good, then they really want to sign you back. So Rene then they, renegotiate. Yeah, exactly, which is what happened. Because what happened in those days is when you sign a record deal, you would pretty much automatic sign your publishing away. <laughs> so we got five grand for our publishing. We said, wow, we're rich, $5,000, you know. Whoa. Uh, and then, luckily, we got our publishing back. Uh, you got it back because of the third year, three right. year thing. You know, that that's was, incredible yeah. story. Mm -hmm. And and Cause most bands signed away their publishing for even less than five grand a lot of times. And then you've owned it ever since. Yep. yep. Wow. Because I know there was that long period uh, of time where it was like no doors in the commercials or anything. Like John Densmore was really fighting you guys on that and stuff, right? Yeah. Well, we still do. And we haven't had a commercial ever. You know, the, the, the funny thing was uh, back in the day, um, Buick wanted to light my fire. Yeah. Buick. And it was this little cool little opal. Buick Opal car that was low on gas and it was like the new thing. So and we so we thought, hey, that sounds pretty cool. You know, nobody had ever done a car commercial with rock and roll. Uh, and uh, but Jim, we couldn't find him. He was nowhere to be found. So we said, all right, he'll like it. We'll just do it. You know. So we signed it. And of course, when Jim found out about it, he said, you didn't tell me. Blah blah blah. You know. I mean, it was my song. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but he went so nuts about it that we said, okay, we won't do it. We're, we'll pull out of the deal. So ever since that, we never did a commercial. And um, so now it comes up to uh, the time of when Ray and I decided to go out and play The Doors again, 2000, year 2000. Right. And John didn't want to play. So he, he decided, uh, so right at, at that time, Cadillac comes up with this offer of like, I forget it was, 10, 15 million bucks for to, to use break on through. 10, 15 million bucks. Yeah. And Ray wanted to do it because he had he'd been in some financial trouble or something. And John didn't want it. You know, I would have done it just for Ray, you know. Yeah. And John said, no, no, can't do it. <laughs> Because he, you know, he was mad at us for going out without him. Because we got Stuart Copeland and stuff like that. But he didn't want to do it. That's the crazy part about it. Well, yeah, and uh, I think it was more or less to spite Ray, rather than uh, you know, being so uh, altruistic to the music. Oh, you can't, yeah. You know, and then what happened? Led Zeppelin did it. Ended yeah. up doing it. You know. Jeez. <laughs> but. To this day, we haven't uh, used it in a commercial. I now, who uh, owns the stuff? Is it just you and one John quarter, now? One quarter each. One quarter. Mm, that's how it's always been. So, so. Uh, so Ray's, uh, Ray's relatives have one quarter, and Jim's uh, estate has the other quarter. 
Wow. I mean, that you guys have sold over 100 million records, man. Is that all? Is that <laughs> over 100 million records? There's only yeah, a handful yeah. of bands ever to do that. Yeah, and we were the one of the only bands ever to split publishing four ways. That's... Uh, and that was Jim's idea. Even at that time, he was writing all the songs. You know, I hadn't even written Light My Fire yet. And he goes, listen, you guys, I want to... I want to split everything four ways, you know, because he knew we wouldn't put up, up with him <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if he didn't do that. <laughs> were, there, were there times where it, it was just insane, where you're just like, this guy is absolutely a lunatic? Yeah, I, I think there's there was enough of those times where we would have broke up had it not, not been for that four-way split. Oh, you know? shit. Yeah, I mean, I, that's a good thing for bands to do, really. Right. If they're serious, I should. Especially John Densmore. I mean, he's not writing anything, right? Right. I mean, and then there he is blocking you guys. It's like, hey, man, <laughs> you're getting a cut of something you didn't write. Get in on this. <laughs> I do understand that hold this, um, this, uh, this thing that Jim was uh, so behind, not commercializing, but this is a whole different era now. And as you get older and stuff, right, and like you said, exactly. Ray was financially in trouble. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's a way, it, it, it's it's your money. That's what it is. Yep. You know, I, I mean, there is the argument that, hey, it's pretty cool never to do a commercial because, you know, money is bad, you know. <laughs> yeah. You're embarrassed about, yeah. you know, we're supposed to be artists and all this shit. But uh, I, I didn't, uh, didn't see it that way. Do you look at that New Haven concert? I look at it as the day the outlaw rock and roll star was born that day. I look at it like that, and I think most people do. All of a sudden, it was this blueprint of uh, fuck the man. We and we are rock and roll, and uh, you know, there's yeah. the headshot. Next thing you know, everybody's a radical. Yeah, that was uh, that was pretty uh, pretty cool. Uh, yeah, Jim was uh, pretty pissed. I don't blame him, you know. Yeah, getting he, maced. Yeah, I mean, well, why why did he have to do that? Uh, you know, the guy didn't realize who Jim was. Obviously, right. he was thought he was just somebody that snuck backstage, and. Uh, you know, of course, Jim's not one who's going to sit and explain something to a guy. You know? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, he got Mason and then told the story on in the middle of Backdoor Man. He says, oh, you know what happened backstage? You know, this man, funny little man in a funny blue suit and a funny <laughs> little hat. Yeah. <laughs> Are you up there like, oh shit? <laughs> yeah. Like you got to be thinking like this. This is going down. Because uh, yeah, <laughs> there was a whole bunch of cops right down in front, you know. Yeah. And which was kind of weird because I never seen that many cops at a show before, you know. I don't know why there were so many, but uh, they hauled them off stage and uh, smacked them around a bit. Man. It was even. A, it was in Life magazine. Big picture on the. Right next to the back cover. Instant stardom from that. <laughs> I mean, that's just like every teenage boy is like, yeah, fuck yeah. Right. You know, I got to get leather pants and that <laughs> and that belt here, that concho belt. Right, and the concho belt. Let's talk a little bit about the Hollywood Bull because we're here at the Whiskey and I always heard the... Uh, the uh, rumblings of we want to build a PA big enough to where they could hear us down at the Whiskey A Go Go. Who built that? The Acoustic, the company Acoustic. Uh, yeah, yeah, we were with a company called Acoustic Amps, and um, to tell you the truth, the guitar amps kind of sucked because they were like two fifteen inch. Oh yeah, just and then a, and then a, a horn. Yeah, zero breakup. Yeah, exactly. They're great for for keyboards. And bass, they had a good bass amp, the 360 bass amp. But so for guitar, I I actually jimmied my own one that it looked like an acoustic, but it had oh. different stuff in it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, so that for the Hollywood Bowl, we said, man, we want to be really loud because this is a big place, and we want to be able to hear it down at the whiskey. So we, we got Acoustic to bring all their amps down there. 52. Whoa. 52 amps. Whoa. Stretched across the stage. So we're warming up. We're, we're 
getting ready to play, and then all of a sudden this guy comes up, and he's got this a DB meter. Goes, oh yeah. Oh, by the way, guys, uh, you can only you can't go over a hundred DB at the Hollywood Bowl. <laughs> yeah. The neighbors will come play. <laughs> so, oh shit. <laughs> yeah. And especially for me because you know I already have too little breakup, you know, with uh, one amp, much less ten. Uh, so I ended up using one. Whoa. So you guys, you went by the rules? Yeah. Oh, yeah. shit. What else can we do? They would have pulled the plug. So there it is, this full system up there, and it's just on two. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the guitar sounds so bad. How was, was that? smart, I would have just went and got a twin reverb, you know. That's what I should have done. Was it a good gig? It was, uh, except for the guitar sound, it was a good gig. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there you are playing the Hollywood Bowl, yeah. the iconic venue in your hometown. It's kind of like you, I mean, you already made it, but I'm saying this is it, our homecoming gig. Right. Yeah. I mean, that part of it was cool. And uh, let's see, who played with us? I think it was Steppenwolf and uh, maybe the Chambers Brothers. It was, it was fun, but just horrible guitar sound. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they they made it sound okay on the on the. Yeah, on the sounds film. great. Yeah, I love that one. I love that just, one, and I love the just, felt form one. You can't play right if your sound isn't right. You know. Oh, not at all. It's yeah. just dying out, yeah. especially if you're playing slide. Yeah, you know, you play a lot of slide or or long, you know, sustain notes. I couldn't do my music sober thing. Yeah, very good. I was just pissed. <laughs> when you look at the catalog of the Doors records, which one do you think is your favorite, if you really listen to them all? Uh, you know, it changes, you know, with, depending on which one I'm listening to. Right, yeah. I mean, there's good stuff on all of them, you know. Oh, of course. And and there's not much bad stuff. No, you there's know? not. I mean, that's, the, all, you know, the deep tracks are, are all good, so that's uh, that's what I like about it. You know, when I play the Doors stuff, you know, whoever I'm playing, and whoever's in the band, they always want to play the deep tracks. You know, yeah. Hey, let's play. Uh, like 20s. Not to Touch the Earth. Yeah. Something. That kind of haunting stuff. Right. The changing. That, yeah. That stuff changing. is just insane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. A lot of people never heard that, you know. So that's kind of, that's, that's what makes it fun to play Doors music for me. Yeah, Absolutely. I I gotta say I love the L.A. Woman record. Oh yeah, oh, you know yeah. I love everything about it. I love the cover. <laughs> I love uh, what's his name from Elvis Presley's band on bass. Jerry Ship. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and I and I just love the the vibe of that record. It was kind of like okay, we made it out of the '60s. We're still a band, and you're recording this really cool blues like blues rock record yeah uh you know what that record to me it, it had jim come back from paris like he was supposed to that's how that's the direction we would have, have kept going right because we actually wrote some of that stuff as a band which was the first time we'd ever done that it was always you know either me or jim or me and jim or just jim and this time it, for instance the song la woman oh. we really we were just jamming around, and it kind of happened, you know? It's crazy. That and uh, Riders on the Storm. Those two tracks are just in insane. Yeah. Now, that's the one Rothschild quits, right? He's like, I'm out of here. Yeah. He produces all your records but that one. He's yeah. like, this yeah. sounds like some... Uh, what did he say? <laughs> Co <laughs> cocktail music. Yeah, cocktail yeah. music. Yeah. <laughs> Riders on the Storm, he said. Yeah. Sounds like cocktail music because of the tinkly piano. I Did guess. he ever call you later and go, "Man, I was wrong"? No, no, no. After he, he wasn't that kind. After of guy. he quits, <laughs> is it is it a sour fallout? No, not really. I mean, you know, he, you know what? He had just produced Janice's first yeah. solo album. You know, he saw himself going. You know, the, to him, the doors were on their way down. You know, I hate to say that about him, but. Uh, I think that that's what was in his mind, and and he was he he could tell that Jim was kind of, you know, going downhill, and he had just had that happen with Janice, and he he just said, hey, I can't do this again, you know, I I, I kind of don't blame him. 
man, that was that was definitely a, a, an insane uh, spiral in in a quickness of that. Yeah, of Jimmy like f- and then Janice and then yeah, yeah. And Jim said, after the two of them, he said, "I'm next." That that part's spooky, right? Yeah. Do you like? Do you give into that conspiracy of like, you know, these people? He was alive, and there was there was no body, and all this stuff. Did you guys ever get get like dig into that? No, oh, man. I, you know, I, he was pretty sick when he went to Paris. He yeah, was, had a horrible cough. Um, I don't know. He might have had pneumonia for all I know, and. Uh, and in Paris at that time, that that they were just getting into the China White thing, you know, which his old lady was into, Pam, uh, and then of course uh, Quavassier and all that shit. Yeah, you can't do that along with the other. No, for very long. Do you think there was heroin involved in that? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I'll absolutely. Bet, I'll bet. Yeah, I, I can't say for sure. Yeah, but uh, yeah, even even without heroin, it, it just drinking too much the condition he was in um you know he had no filter you know what i mean he he just <laughs> would not didn't know how to relax you know? yeah he was all in wow let's talk uh hot rock and roll hall of fame you uh you guys had eddie vetter sing yeah and uh that was pretty damn cool it were was. you were you aware of vetter before or uh, keeping up with mm-hmm. like newer music at that time yeah, a little bit, a little bit, you know. Uh, you know, we knew all about about the, you know, grunge thing. And uh, and I, don't, I forget whose idea it was for to get Eddie to sing, but uh, that was perfect. And he was a huge Doors fan. You know, he uh, he cornered me <laughs> that day and and uh, for about two hours, you know, just yeah. everything about Jimmy wanted to know, you know. Yeah. Um, and the funny thing was, he, we had a big storm that day, the day before, the Grammys. So he, and he decided to drive down from, yeah. from Seattle. Wow! Uh, and drive uh, down to L.A. Yeah. Wow. So it, he he almost missed the whole thing because of, of the storm, you know. So we didn't get to rehearse really. It was just oh, like shit. a sound check kind of thing. And Don was played bass, but it, it came out good. It was great. Uh, went, I mean, man, just you, you guys, are, as they would say, uh, first ballot Hall of Famers. <laughs> like, can you imagine if you didn't go in the first run? <laughs> It'd be like, well, the place would burn to the ground. Was that the first? Year? I mean, the fir- it was the first time you guys were up. I think you were eligible. You just went right in. When did they start that Hall of Famers? I don't Fame? know, actually. I, I think it wasn't too far, but, you know, I don't think we were that far down the line i don't know it uh, probably, i think what they did back then was they started in the 50s so oh. they went through the 50s bands it's like elvis chuck Berry, all that and then they got to the 60s and you guys went right in i think uh, that's how they did it yeah chuck Berry. so uh, yeah exactly yeah. so they start with the fit there it is full circle for you <laughs> yeah chuck Berry. Wow, yeah that's cool what was the Isle of Wight like? You guys went out there and played. Was that your first giant festival in Europe? Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, you know, everybody was there. Jimmy, the Stones, and... Uh, Ooh. Wow. It was kind of a, a fuck-up because that was the first time, I think, that the... Uh, they charged too much and the kids were mad and they broke down the barriers and and a bunch of kids got beat up and thrown in jail and Joni Mitchell was in tears and you know it was it was kind of a mess but uh but it was cool just to see all those great bands and to be on that show the problem was Jim was at that time he was kind of in a bad mood because of the trial was oh, hanging yeah. over his head you know and he he was kind of fat he gained a bunch of weight and he had the big bushy beard <laughs> and so they they were filming the whole thing murray Lerner, and uh so jim says right before we go and he goes you can only have red lights oh <laughs> red lights oh <laughs> dark red Dark and Mary Lerner's going crazy. Ah, we can't do that. It's going to be horrible. 
Um, that's it. Take it or leave it. You know. So it's that's why it, it looks so dark when we're playing, which is kind of cool, I think. Yeah. Well, it matches the band and the music. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, uh, it makes you can't see how fat Jim is either. No. <laughs> <laughs> but he he was kind of boring that night. He just he just kind of went going through the motion. You know, he sang well, he sang yeah. really good. But he just under the mic and didn't move an inch. It was kind of weird. That's unusual. Like when you see a guy going through different phases, you got to be kind of like, uh oh, here we go. Yeah, this is gonna be something different tonight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but they uh, they just put the film out. I think uh, doors at. The, oh really? Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, it's pretty pretty cool. Were you guys actually bummed you didn't do Woodstock? I had heard oh, yeah. that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That it, was Ray's fault. Yeah. Ray decided, are you kidding? Woodstock? Nobody's going to come to that, man. It's too far from New York. You know, it's going to be a bust. <laughs> Ray said that? Yeah. Hilarious. <laughs> Stupid. So you guys, did you get offered to play? Yeah. Or? We, oh, you yeah, did? Yeah, we could have played there. Oh, shit. Yeah, no, we didn't get uh, offered to play at the uh, Monterey. Oh, Monterey Pop. Yeah. But uh, Jim went to that. There's photos of him there, right? No. No? No, we were playing in New York at the time. We oh. couldn't get out of our gig in New oh, York. Oh, that's right. I read yeah. about that. It was like... Uh, Steve, the scene. Paul, Steve Paul, the scene club. We were. We had a contract to play there. Yeah, that sucks. But you know what? They didn't even invite us anyway. Yeah, because uh, Lou Adler, I think, was pissed at us. Uh, right, he moved some dates or something. I read like um, he did some kind of mojo where you couldn't do it. Like no, he, he just didn't. He did. He was mad at us because he wanted to produce us. Oh, and we didn't want him to produce us. Oh, oh man, I, I, that's what I think anyway. Were there other producers you ever thought about when you guys were working with Paul? No. That was it. Yeah. I mean, it was a perfect uh, fit for me anyway. I, I certainly wouldn't have picked anybody else. That was my dream producer. Um, you know, looking back, yeah, I kind of would have been nice to have, have had, uh, you know, one of those great producers of the day, but not Lou Adler. <laughs> yeah, not Lou Adler. <laughs> <laughs> Zappa wanted to produce us. Zappa? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What, how did that come about? That's cool. He used to hang out the whiskey and see us play, you know. And, you know, but in those days, the, you know, Zappa was, it was like a kind of a parody band or something. You know, it was the Mothers of Invention. It was right. Like, it was all, you know, humor. And, and we just didn't think he was would be right for us, you know. Zappa, he, he might have been cool. That is wild, yeah. man. What kind of uh, what kind of bands were you seeing? Were, did you see Zeppelin and stuff in here? Were you going to that? Um, I never saw Zepp Yeah. Oh, I did. No, no, that was uh, that was uh, Jimmy Page. Uh, what was the earlier band he was the, in? The Firm. Oh, there. Oh, Yardbirds. Yardbirds. Oh wow, I yeah, saw Yardbirds. Saw Yardbirds, and I saw Jimmy at the at the whiskey. Yeah. I saw Cream at the whiskey. Whoa. Yeah. You saw Jimmy here? Yeah, the whiskey. Whoa. What cream? Yeah. How about Chicago? Were you hanging out with those guys? Yeah. In fact, um, Panko lived right across the street from me. Oh, wow. Yeah. And and Terry was a friend of mine. He, His uh, his second wife was uh, good friends with my wife. And um, so... Uh, Terry was a monster. Yeah. Jesus, man. Yeah, he was cool. I mean, just think about that that music scene that was going down. We're sitting here in the whiskey. Mm -hmm. It's like you guys, Jimmy, uh, uh, you know, Cream. Otis Redding. Otis Redding. <laughs> I saw it, his it's, uh, first. It's insane to think yeah. about. what, And this building's still here. <laughs> That's what's amazing. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty neat. How did it come about that? Ian sing, starts singing with you guys. Did you look at other guys? I mean, I remember you guys did that one thing for MTV where you had different singers, right? Right, right. So how does Ian uh, lock into that? Well, Ian, uh, he was always a big Doors fan. Of course. And he was a friend of Danny Sugarman, who wrote the book. Yeah. And, and, and was actually our manager for a while. 
Um, so, you know, he was always trying to get Ian together with us, and, you know, it was always something would happen. Ray and John weren't getting along, or Ray, Ray and I weren't getting along, and it's just never the right timing. Um, and so just at that time, right, about the year 2000, I, I guess Ian... I guess the the cult really was kind of broke up for a while or something, right? And it was the perfect timing. Uh, yeah, he was great. Yeah, I man. Wish that would have lasted longer. But I saw it at some Harley Davidson event. Oh yeah, Hell and yeah. Uh, you guys were killing it. I was like, this is this is amazing. That was our first show. Yeah, that was yeah. Yeah, Stuart Copeland on drums. That thing was great, man. <laughs> you guys were killing it. Yeah, that was good. That were you were you show. going out to the uh, punk rock scene a lot? You were talking about seeing Fear, but did mm -hmm. punk grab you a lot? Uh, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. X, mean, you know, Fear, Devo. Sure. Were yeah. you into that stuff? All that stuff. Yeah, um, not as much as Ray. You know, Ray really. You know, he produced X and stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. But I was I was trying to do jazz and stuff more at that time. Now you, what do you got? Like six solo records out. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How often, how much do you play now? Um, quite a bit, you know. I yeah. Mean, not as much as some people, I'm sure, but uh, like my buddy Alice Cooper, man, <laughs> yeah, does 300 nights a year. I don't know how he does it. That's crazy, right? I know. But I, you know, I like to play just for fun. I have different projects. Like right now, I got this thing with. Um, some jazz guys and we we just play around town you know like uh at the uh, canyon club or places like that and then you know the door stuff I, I i i do that as well with my son waylon singing oh wow yeah that's wow pretty cool how old's your son he is 46 but he acts like he's 26 <laughs> Well, that's how you, that's how it's got to be, man. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Acts like he's twenty six. <laughs> You're seventy four. How's your hearing? Mine's fried. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, I, actually, it's not that bad. You know, I I, I actually went and got some hearing aids, and um, tell you the truth, they don't really uh, make much difference. You know, it's um, now my son Waylon, his hearing was really bad, and we both got the hearing aids and he he said it just changed his whole life it's it's uh you know if your hearing is bad enough then it's like a miracle you know yeah so you know one of these days and i've never wore earplugs never never, never. i cannot play with earplugs i hate it and i hate those in-ears monitors oh yeah yeah I, it just doesn't sound right you know when i'm playing i have to hear my amp you got to feel the, the air, the yeah, movement of the air. Right. Yeah. How many guitars you got now? You got a bunch? I had not as many as like Bonamassa or somebody, you know. Yeah. I got I got like 30 guitars. Whoa. That's not very much. 30. <laughs> <laughs> I remember from a, a man who had one through the whole doors. <laughs> and then you picked up a, a second one. Oh, I got a 54 or a Les Paul here. Gibson did that cool reissue of your 54 right yeah well they did my other one too my, oh wow my red one yeah uh about 25 years ago I, I picked up a 67 sg which i still use every night and uh they made a model of that it's a little different it has a the neck from a 61 uh junior you know that wide flat yeah neck. yeah yeah so that's pretty cool those are all gone unfortunately I wish I could. I still have a couple, um, and um, they're gonna they're gonna make uh, next year. They're gonna make a model of my '67 exactly how it is. Oh wow! Yeah, wow. That's and gonna it's be... gonna have one of my paintings on it. That's gonna be great. Yeah. Do you have all your uh, doors like memorabilia and stuff like gold records and oh, stuff? Man, I wish I'd kept more of that stuff. I've got some, but you know, I I was never a collector or a a hoarder, you know. Uh, so much stuff I wish I would have kept. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Especially in the eBay world. <laughs> right, right. Well, like, you know, I, I do a lot of charity stuff, so if I if I had kept that stuff, it would have been great to be able to, to auction some of that stuff off. 
I, I, somebody's got that guitar of mine that stole that guitar. I, yeah. I just hope the, I, I'm sure whoever it is doesn't realize what it is. Yeah, right. You know, some guy probably, he, whoever stole it probably sold it for a hundred bucks. Yeah. And, and somebody sanded it. He probably. He painted yeah. it, you know. <laughs> I don't want to get caught. They painted it with primer. <laughs> and then it ended up in a, it ended up in a, like a punk band in the 80s. Circle Jerks or something was playing it. <laughs> they probably smashed it. <laughs> yeah, they smashed it on some guy's head. <laughs> it, it's just like a historic guitar. <laughs> just gone. Oh, my God. God, I, I love that, man. Yeah. I can't thank you enough for uh, talking to me. Hey, no problem. Um, I'm telling you, you, like I said, man, you played in the greatest LA band of all time. Yeah, and lucky, you, lucky. You're a rock you're and roll right place at the right time. That's what you got to do. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But I'm also, I mean, you wrote great songs. Yeah. If the band had no songs, we wouldn't be sitting here talking that's, about that's you. That's right, especially the ones I wrote. That's the bottom line, you know. Yeah. You got to have great songs, and you guys had so many great <laughs> songs. I was laughing. I was looking at the, there was like some greatest hits on iTunes or something. I was just laughing. It was just a, a row of just incredible songs any band would take one of those and and be touring on that one hit still <laughs> you know i know well thanks for uh, talking to me no yeah, social no media for you right uh i, I do I have oh guy. yeah what is it i have facebook and and the other one instagram you I, get on I have there a guy that does it for me I, oh I, yeah i never go on it myself <laughs> robbie, krieger robbie krieger art I love these guys. You guys are like, yeah, I got to do that. I paint as well. So. Oh, you paint and yeah. draw. That's why they call it art. Oh, wow. What are you, uh, are you uh, into oils or what? Uh, the other one. Um, acrylic? Acrylic. Oh, wow. Yeah. So what? I, what I do a lot is I, I paint on plexiglass. And then, so I'll put the, I'll paint on one side of the plex and then I'll get another piece and I'll squish it on there and, and you get some great effects by moving around. Wow. And, and then I do regular paint, painting as well, but, um, um, you know, I'm no Ronnie Wood, but, uh, yeah. but, but uh, I, I do some pretty cool stuff. In fact, there's one of them right up there. Can you see it in the back? See the... Uh, it's, it's, oh, right there. Yeah, it's called. Oh, wow, that's beautiful. Light, light my fire. It's called. Wow. Yeah, that's that is, that's amazing. Yeah, that's pretty much the favorite one. So we make copies of it and we sell them, and the money goes to different charities. Oh, that's cool. Who it's are your charities? Art for a Cause. It's called um, St. Jude's. I do a lot, and uh, I have a, another charity called the Music Path, where we're trying to get music back in schools oh that's that's a that's a must man yeah. bill graham was way into that too was he he would do like these shows at the fillmore and they give all the money to keep uh music project uh you know classes in school oh, in san francisco that's cool yeah that's a big oh. big deal for yeah. you know because you know that's always the first thing they cut out uh, always the music. yeah i always say get rid of the sports keep the art yeah, really yeah they can play sports at home i know <laughs> in the backyard <laughs> <laughs> no sports is a big money maker for i hear you college which is but you know stupid. sports didn't sell 100 million records that's true too. <laughs> thanks for doing the uh, show man yeah. thank you so much it was yeah. great talking to you i love yeah. you man all right, guys. Uh, let's all thank the whiskey family yeah, here. Yeah, whiskey. Yeah, I absolutely love this place. Amy, and, and should have a. Let's show a picture of Amy. Yeah, she's so great. Come on up, Amy. No. Yeah, yeah. No. Come up here. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Let There Be Talk. Keep the candles lit. Don't forget to subscribe on YouTube and uh, iTunes. And thank you. <laughs>